Motor Talk. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to UK Motor Talk. I'm Mike, hello. Hello, I'm Jim. Hello, I'm Graham. And let's start by saying this is episode 206 and of course Peugeot's. Continuing our uh, run of uh, French girl. This is the French era of the podcast, isn't it? Although it's not going to last much longer, is it? Until we do another 100 episodes and then it will get good again with the 306. <laughs> mm, I was stuck behind the relatively woeful 307 today on the way into work, which of course was in the right hand lane doing 60 miles an hour until it got to the roundabout and it decided to cut up the car that was in front of me in the left-hand lane just so that it could turn left, having been in the right-hand lane for the entire stretch of the dual carriageway, blocking all the traffic behind. So that uh, that seems remarkably appropriate. Did it have a French number plate by any chance? It, it sounds no, as though it might have done. Actually driving on what it thought was the right side of the road. It was in that metallic blue with three hubcaps, which probably tells you all you need to know. <laughs> There's... I'm interested, actually, guys. Pet hates with cars, little things that really wind you up. One of them, for me, is one hubcap missing, but probably the most irritating thing. When you see a number plate on a car, and someone, particularly if they've got a private plate or something, they're obviously proud of it, but the people are too tight to get a new number plate made when they change the car and just drill extra holes in it, or fit a shortened plate and leave all the holes in the rear bumper or front bumper exposed around where the old number plate used to be those things really really irritate me have you, have you guys got irritating just things that are probably quite insignificant to most people but personally really wind you up hmm. no i mean it's, it's, things on cars that irritate me i mean peugeots do spring to mind because they have that weird <laughs> thing where you you unlock them and the indicators flash twice or whatever it is you lock them and the indicators flash 4,879 times Epilepsy in, in what I think is a really arrogant way. I, I don't know why. It it's just, it, it, yeah, it's just, I don't like it at all at all. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean about the three hubcaps. It is, uh, it is a bit lazy. I mean, yeah, wonky number plates, wonky badges, that kind of thing. It's, I mean, when I'd um, bought the, uh, the private, Ponzi private plate for the Caterham and swapped the plates over, I bought a short and rear plate. Uh, cause it, it looked better with a fewer number of digits on it. Took the rear plate off, and there was a little mark behind it. So I thought, oh, do I? Oh, no, I didn't really want to fit a shorter plate. And you could see an outline and a mark of where the old number plate was. So I just got a new rear number plate made up, normal size, and put that where the old one was. So it, it all looked neat and proper. I mean, the short and plate, the front was much easier because the nose cone is short. You know, the old number plate that Makes was sense. too long, that was a normal size, despite being a shorter number plate, stuck out from the edges of the nose cone. And I thought, well, why would you do that? Surely it's the the, the whole mounting surface is shorter. So yeah, fit a smaller number plate to it. It just makes sense. So yeah, ill-fitting number plates, wonky number plates. Uh, yeah. I think for me, the thing I find particularly irritating is debadging. Because debadging for me always means that the car ain't what you're claiming it to be. Well, you're not claiming it to be anything. So I'm, I'm the, well, the, the, the yes. civil war about De- to erupt here because it's I, I'm a big fan of debadging. No, me too. I think it's a horrible habit. You know, debadging when, when you, yes, but not up badging. Up badging well, you can't when do. You, when you've got something which is debadged so that you'll think it's rather better than it is, and you realise that you you couldn't get a bloody toothbrush up the exhaust pipe, so it's, it's hardly the sports version, even if it does uh, carry an M Sport badge sticker, which you can buy at your local petrol station for a couple of bob. Uh, you know, I just uh, I, I just hate debadging. Particularly so, though, coming back to what you were saying a moment ago, if the debadging actually involves removing the badge and not filling the holes, then that's the worst of all crimes, I think. That's horrible. I think on the, on the Peugeot 20, whatever it is, like the 207, 607 era, the boot release, which I think is quite smart, is inside the O. So if you do debadge it, what happens with the boot release? Because you're just going to have a random circle in the middle of your car or to the left hand side. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure it's in the middle of the O. Correct me if I'm, I'm sure someone will correct me. Tell us if I've got that wrong. There you go. Let me know. Say so you got this wrong and tag us at UK Motor Talk. Quite a lot of American cars, you have to lift the rear number plate, don't you? Because that's where the filler cap is. I think that's quite smart. Yeah, yeah that's quite so, a good so idea. It keeps it hidden. I like it. Yeah. Or inside the like tail lamp. Yes. What was that? That was the Buick Electra, I think, wasn't it? 
in the sixties where you you had to you had to open the tail light on the left hand side, right hand side, whichever it was, and the the filler cap was just behind that. That's a that's right. a neat piece of engineering. Mm. So I I really could probably do with a better engineering solution for filling up the onion because since I've lowered it, made it less practical. The, the fizzle, filler, this is a definitely a first world problem, isn't it? But the filler nozzle is now quite a bit lower. So it's not a particularly comfortable place to fill the car up. So you have to sort of lean back against it and squat. And it, you just look like an absolute wazzock when you're trying to fill it you've up. Heard, you've never tried to fill up a Caterham 7, have you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, how, how do you fill that? Do you have to kneel on the floor? Yeah, kneeling uh, on the you, floor. You, on the, you on squat the... <laughs> when, when you're filling it up. And also because of the way the neck is angled, the cutoffs tend not to work too well. So you have to sort of, you know, half squeeze oh. the trigger half as much and be a little bit careful. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, a a bit of an undignified process to fill up a seven. But again, first world problems. I'm just just imagining this here now. So you're squatting behind your seven with the nozzle between your hands and it's sort of at waist height and you're sat there repeatedly clicking it. You're gonna look like an absolute pervert. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yes, and when 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 the person behind the cash desk comes over the PA, why are you doing number seven? <laughs> Everyone's. I am look. number seven in my uh, in my Caterham seven, which is debadged. I must admit as well. So there we go. <laughs> Probably there's less European brands that put badges all over the back of cars because when I was a kid, you'd have one on the back that said ABS, one that said the engine size one that said the model, one that said the trim and everything else. And I think you still get that on a few of the Chinese brands. And I think there was a Suzuki I was behind today that had so many badges on the back of it. And none of them were quite the same chrome and none of them were quite the same font. And I thought that looked cack, I have to yeah, say. I think it was always a, uh, a Cavalier, wasn't it, that told you it was a Vauxhall Cavalier 1.8, 4x4, yes. ABS, I, something else, something else. It told you every single option. Yes. It, was, it was like reading the spec sheet on the back of the car, wasn't it? I mean, the, if you had to replace that badge today with the prices of car parts, it would be about 300 quid for the badge, wouldn't it? Well, all of those all of those badges in, in period were out of somebody's parts bin, essentially, which is why they all look different. You know, they're all different shapes, sizes, and different fonts, sometimes completely different fixing methods as well. So, you know, they, they did look a bit of a random mess, but I'm loath to mention this, but I seem to remember Ford being very guilty of that, certainly through the yeah, 70s and 80s. Right. Sticking lots of badges on the boot. A Volvo, the Lambda Sond, of course, the... Mm-mm. the, the, the yeah, well, what front, was Lambda all it? about? It's like, why why does it tell you it's, a Lambda is a so sensor, a Lambda sensor. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah. An oxygen sensor, yeah. Hmm. So, like, what would you have next? The Ford Fiesta 1.4 Flight Hego? Is it just like a list of bits you're going to have to replace as the car gets on in age? <laughs> the sure Mazda cars... MX-5 rear subframe. I'm sure they used to say things like catalyst on the back of cars that had cats as well in the early yes. days. Yes. Yeah, in I mean, the early yeah, days, yes. Yeah, you yeah, don't get DPF, PPF on the back of cars, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Can you just imagine all the various different acronyms that are related to cars now? But ABS, EBD, Lane Keep Assist, whatever, the various different things that you've got on their bliss. Just to, you'd have to have it as a window sticker across the back. Well, no, I That's mean, it, you, 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 the designers would all get together and redesign boots so that the boot was, in fact, it didn't need a boot flip because the, the boot, in fact, was low at the front and six feet high at the back. So you had enough room to get all the badges on. Yes. So, nevertheless, I'm going to say I'm, I'm a plus one for badge deleting. I'm, I'm quite happy to have the badges gone on the car. Although, one thing I've seen quite recently is that the new Audi A3, and I assume this will be the same across the rest of the Audi range, you can have the badges as in the Audi rings now in black. And when I saw one coming towards me with the black pack, so no chrome on it, it just looked like someone had nicked the Audi badge off the grid. It looks really weird. I'm, I'm yeah, not it was a bit like that, a VW's so. back in the day. I think was it a Mark IV Golf? You could get a debadged front grille, but of course mm. the badge extended into the bonnet. So all you yes, had was a did. weird little, not quite a semicircle, but you know a bit less than a semicircle of a cutout in the uh, in the bonnet. But I think the yeah the the rear. I mean VW. I don't think want their cars debadged because my old no. Mark II Golf. I took the badges off, and yeah, there were two whacking great holes behind it, which, funnily enough, is where they used to start to rust because water would get in there. Um, mm. But yes, they didn't want you to debadge that. And going back to the boot release thing, lots of VWs had the boot release in the badge. 
So again, that's, you couldn't debadge the rear badge either. Yeah, yeah. Mm, and now they have the reversing cameras a lot of the time in there, so they don't get covered in dirt, which is a great idea. I think Merck too. Yeah. Although Amy's car, the front badge is the crash sensors. So if you try and debadge that or cover it over with something, it instantly thinks you're going to have a crash all the time. That's it. So the uh, the VW Audi group not a fan of debadging. Yes, anti anti debadging. Just uh, with a digression, uh, as is my wont, I'm sure I told you the story some time ago of the VW Beetle powered 35B Bugatti, which I drove uh, and was a pretty awful car many, many years ago. And I actually saw one come up for auction the other day in Holland. 20 grand. Wow. Extraordinary amount of money. Just if, uh, if Bugatti are listening, please don't let Graham's harsh comments put you off loaning as any demonstrators out of the current press fleet. I don't, don't want to alienate our friends i love the cars and I, and I have been in a real 35b driven by somebody else i didn't get a chance to drive it but this particular one this is a beetle powered one it just it, it looked like a extremely elegant dune buggy just thinking about debadging i'm sure there was some sort of urban myth some time ago that you weren't allowed to debadge your car because then the police wouldn't know what it was is this one of these myths that came about like you would get arrested if you had the courtesy light on in your car when you're driving along at night time? This- yeah, I think that, that sounds like utter bobbins in that they it, wouldn't know what it was. But it's uh, although I think it's uh, – did, didn't somebody use that as a, a way of getting out a parking ticket or a speed ticket? They, they'd they written down that it was a something else, and the guy replied with, my plates must have been cloned because I own a such and such, not a whatever you said it is. So therefore, yeah. it couldn't have been that car, which actually, yeah, is, is if it's not recorded correctly in that way, then fine. You'd imagine ANPR these days must must be fine, must they? They must understand that. Oh, yeah, but then the, the last time we tried to use some sort of ANPR lookup system was for passing your <laughs> Focus RS in a train station car park. And it said, once yes. you'd enter the registration at the 98th time of trying, to park your blue Ford Deu... Press one now. It's like that's close enough. I'll press one. That'll do. As I said, ultimately, if it comes to it, if they say no, it's not a day. I'll print out a day badge for you and stick that. On <laughs> <laughs> Sounds entirely reasonable. Well, there we are. See, the parking association, uh, private parking association, has now said that it will adopt a ten minute. I think it is um, period uh, where you won't be charged for parking on private land, but. Uh, it's going to be complicated for them, so they won't actually introduce it for two years. It's all a bit rubbish, anyway. I've, I, I take issue. They're with all a, lot a bit of these, rubbish. I take a lot of issue with these private parking companies because usually the businesses who they're trying to protect don't benefit in any way, and all that no. happens is no. there's one near where we work where they've been aggressively finding people if the car's not entirely in the space. So if the car's too long to fit in the space, for example, and they're quite short spaces. It's not in the space enough, so they get a sixty pound fine. It's just it's absolutely outrageous. And I was I was late getting back to my car, which I hadn't driven to parking, when it was my granddad's wake. And I wrote a letter to explain to them, sorry, I was I think I was twelve minutes late getting back to the car. Very you know, sorry about that. I didn't, and they said, Well, it's your fault, you should have read the sign. I said, Well, I was a bit busy at the time, arriving you know, with a morning party and, a, and I didn't even drive my car there. Not our problem. You're, you know, it's basically your, your ignorance, not not ours. And you just think, yeah. oh, great, what lovely, lovely people. Evil yeah. people. I, I I really, really, really can't stand them. They absolutely wind me up. Mm. The things that they these companies have been allowed to get away with over many, many years, there's, there's virtually no control over them uh, yeah. or over the, how they choose to pursue their spurious debts. Um, yeah. I, I, I think the whole... The whole industry is a bloody disgrace. Well, like I say, I, I just find it irritating that the DVLA release your details and what basis are the DVLA releasing details agree. to these people? Yeah, because uh, yeah. we've we've had it in the past at work. We've wanted somebody's details. I mean, there was one guy we'd uh, we'd charged him the wrong pump. We charged him for the other side and charged him fifty quid instead of twenty quid or whatever it was. Wasn't a regular customer. Had never seen him before. So we thought, oh, what do we do? Uh, do, do, do. Oh, oh, I got an idea. Right to the DVLA, and we we sent off our check for two pounds fifty or whatever it was to request the details and say, you know, we'd overcharge the guy by thirty quid. Can we have his details so we can send him his money back? And they said no. 
Mm. Right, okay. So if you're, you're quite happy to... Uh, but presumably these big cup parking companies pay lots and lots and lots of £2.50 every year. So the DVLA are a bit nicer to them because they spend more money. But yeah, I I never gave DVLA permission to release my details to a third party. So it seems wrong. In recent years, I've become a bit obsessive about uh, keeping fuel receipts, well, receipts generally. There's a garage on the A27 that um, the first I was aware that there was a problem was when they sent me a letter saying that they were threatening to uh, uh, repossess my car for taking fuel and driving away and uh, so on and so on and so on. And um, I'd actually kept the receipt, and they were, t- they were obviously from uh, their CCTV system. There were two cars on the full court at the same time. One paid me, the other one didn't. And they did a 50-50 and decided to chase me, so uh, I was able to prove that uh, they couldn't. I did actually get a formal apology out of them after threatening to take the matter up formally through the courts, but um, it it just really irritates me what what some of these organisations can get away with. The tricky thing is if someone does do something like, I don't know, clone your car, clone your plates or something similar, and you get caught speeding somewhere, quite often the owner seems to be on you to prove that you weren't the person driving that vehicle and isn't your car. And if it's a very similar car, so say, for example, I don't know, you've got two Ford Fiestas and they only, they're both silver. It's going to be very difficult to tell which is which unless one's been debadged or something. Um, <laughs> you'll be able to know maybe that was yours. But otherwise, yeah. And, and the same with these parking companies that gain details for, uh, for cars that are supposedly parked legally. What's to stop them going, hmm, I fancy going and nicking a, whatever that is, a Lamborghini. Oh, look, let me see if I can find a Lamborghini online. There's a registration for one. Let's request the details of the keeper's address from the DVLA. I think that actually happens. On that point of having your car plates cloned and and being used for other spurious things, so that is actually a very good point. Have something unique at the front of your car and the rear of your car. So whether it's debadged, an extra sticker, an IAM logo an air freshener, a sticker in the front windscreen, rear rear windscreen, whatever it happens to be. I mean, let's just say, for argument's sake, somebody decided to clone the number plates off the fist. Mm, I think it's highly (laughs) unlikely they've stuck exactly the same number of stickers on it as we have. Uh, And you're, uh, you know, you're Orion, I think is fairly unique, isn't it? And the the Catrum 7, I don't think there are any two alike, so... It's um yeah actually the uh, the advert for debadging rebadging or even just moving the badge something like that if you move the badge from one side to the other you could say well actually there's a picture of the rear of the car my badge is on the other side so there we are UK Motor to talk top tip there but tell your insurance company if you modify your vehicle of course so they have well, by moving for the badge from left to right <laughs> don't don't even go there don't even go there it's it's there's been all kinds of stuff. It, technically, if you put a window sticker in the car, you've modified it. But don't just it's a whole can of worms and I I don't want to get get involved with are that. We, are we sort fair. of going through our collective motoring pet hates? Because if we're gonna go from parking companies to insurance companies, I'm quite happy to <laughs> make a number of contributions in that area. Um, some of which may well end up uh, with us being banned from the airwaves. But no, I I like insurance companies about as much as I like parking companies. And on that note, two people I'm that going particularly to end it like there. each yeah, but two people that particularly like each other at the moment. Uh, I believe we need to talk about smooth uh yes it was uh of course the uh, the austrian grand prix at the weekend and uh, i mean i think the the first sort of 60 something laps were a bit much of a muchness i mean i normally enjoy the austrian grand prix and there's normally some good racing and alternative strategies and bits and pieces and it's always quite quite a frantic uh qualifying sessions it's such a, a short lap in terms of distance and time there's you know no way in hell particularly in q1 you get 20 cars on track together as they all tend to be spaced out enough to uh to all get a clear lap in uh one thing which i did quite like from the seven million four thousand three hundred and ninety eight and a half track limit violations we had reported at the last austrian grand prix where they're all just taking the mick and running wide um they'd heeded a bit of our advice and uh and just put a few gravel traps in and said there you are there's the limit because they measured 
the distance from the white line, which is the edge of the track, and two metres, which is the width of an F1 car, they then put a gravel trap there. Wonderful invention, gravel wonderful, traps. Wonderful yeah. invention. Resto mod circuits. There was still the, uh, the, the track limits violation for Oscar Piastri in one of the qualifying sessions, I think, for the, uh, the actual race, because I've lost track, so it was a sprint weekend. But he, if, if he was off, he must have been two millimetres over the line, if that. I mean, I, I know two mil over the line is two mil over the line, but if you're going to go wide enough that actually you're kicking up a bit of a bit of dust from the gravel trap if you go any further than that you you lose grip and you're off but it does half look spectacular when a driver turns into a corner or goes through a corner and they kick up just that little bit of dust on the way out you know they are bang on the limit that another 0.2 of a mile an hour would have had him off at that corner but he managed to hold on to it you know i remember uh, sort of late 90s, you'd see Villeneuve, Jacques Villeneuve would always do it. He'd be hanging every single millimetre out of it to try and get a corner flat out or two miles an hour quicker or whatever else. And, and he'd either win it or bin it. But it was it, it gave you that... It gave you that real, this is exciting. And then to get penalty is, is again, no. If you're going to use gravel traps to police track limits then just let the gravel traps do it so if you want to go through there flat out keep your boot in and go through the gravel trap you end up going quicker then fair play good luck to you get on with it that's fine but yeah i think that that was one one highlight leading into the race the uh sprint race a bit much of a muchness and um, the first 60 odd laps of the actual grand prix itself much of a muchness but then lando and max good friends off the track and do lots of sim racing and well, travelling and <laughs> hanging around and going to concerts outside of uh, of Grand Prix weekends had a bit of a ding-dong towards the end, didn't they? I mean, it was good fun to watch. I think that well, that uh, friendly relationship may have changed immediately thereafter. Whether, whether the two of them will patch it up, I don't know. But um, I, it was... You know, we've seen Max here before. He doesn't give up. He doesn't give room. He doesn't give space. And if he finds it necessary to park on top of your car, he will do so, even if you're still sitting in it at the time. That's in the nature of Max. And if you tangle with Max, you take on the beast that he can be on occasion. He's determined. Very determined. He is, but is is it a little bit too determined? I mean, there's there's hard racing, there's... There's on the limit. There's questionable tactics, but the I I thought in particular squeezing Lando over and and bashing into him, which caused the puncture for the pair of them on the way into turn three, was particularly uh, egregious as a move. But what did it for me even more was on the way out of the corner. He had a puncture. He knew he had a puncture. He knew he was going to be slow. Lando's puncture took a little bit longer to materialise, so Lando mm. then was mm. going for the gap that was on the right-hand side, and he closed it again. I mean, that's that's awfully reminiscent of, you know, Dan Tictum or Dick Tantrum, as he's known, with his, his antics behind the safety car of catching up, going full pell, and then crashing into the guy who took him out. It's not it, it's you know when when you're playing mario kart as a kid and you get annoyed that you lose you drive the wrong way around the track to crash into the person that took you out it's it's almost that level of of but it, yeah there petulance is a... and the the there's refusing to back out and then there's being a sore loser which is Unsporting, to take somebody out definitely. as well on yes. the way out it's there is a, there is a code of sporting behavior i mean it, mm. and and uh, I, you know Max, to be honest, has has uh, driven in an excessive manner on a number of occasions. I'm not particularly a Max fan, but then I'm not particularly anti him because when he's when he's at his best, he's he's incredibly exciting. But then, uh, having uh, a, an F1 memory slightly longer, I'm reminded of the sort of earliest days of uh, Michael Schumacher. Michael Schumacher was not uh, above. Uh, bending the rules, obstructing the rules, changing the rules to suit himself. And if that involved uh, doing your fastest lap and then parking the car in the middle of the circuit so that nobody else could, then that's what he would do because he was, could be, uh, on occasion, absolutely ruthless. And uh, 
I think having written on on you know, a number of F1 drivers over the years, sometimes to be the best, you have to be absolutely ruthless. But it 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 doesn't make for pretty or entertaining watching. No, like I say, and it's it's that 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 sporting that fair play. I mean, the the moving under the braking zone that he says he didn't do, but he definitely did. Um, Quite so. You know, a rule that was brought in purely because of what Max Verstappen was doing. Because of Max and the way he drove, there is a rule that says you're not allowed to move in the braking zone. And he did it again. It's it's a little bit... I, I think, as you say, he's, he's a phenomenal driver. And Sergio Perez and, and his performances in the Red Bull, I think, show where the team would be if it wasn't for the brilliance of Max Verstappen and his driving, because Perez was nowhere yet again this weekend. He's, he's what, fifth in the standings now? And his teammate is leading the world championship. So there's uh, there's a lot to be said for Max's extraction of, of performance from that car, which is, is something Perez, who is, you know, a very, very, very good driver, multiple race winner, certainly nothing wrong with his driving ability at all. And but he's he's struggling in that car. So the the skill and the speed of Max can't be underestimated. But it's are, are we almost going back to Max 1.0 or 1.2 or whatever it was in his early days where he, he would never back down and there'd always be a crash. He seemed to to get on top of that and mature slightly, but was a bit of that just because he kind of had the car that he could get out in front and run and hide, and so there was less need for that wheel to wheel. Now he's he's being tested a bit more by Lando on a regular basis, and, and having yes. to push it that bit harder. The nastier side of his character's coming out. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much my reading of it. More for the British GP, do we think? Uh, well, yes. There's, uh, I mean, it. Uh, fr- friend of the podcast, George Russell, was there to uh, to reap the spoils at the weekend. But I think, like he said, uh, they maybe deserve the winning Canada and finish third. Maybe deserve to finish third in Austria and and grab the wins. All all these things seem to shake themselves out. Uh, but yeah, will uh, will that battle carry on again? I mean, I think Lando will be pumped up at Silverstone as he normally is. He went rather well there last year. Home crowd advantage give you a, a couple of tenths there, and and who knows? I mean, I think Silverstone is uh, is probably a classic Red Bull track in terms of it's all high speed, lots of aero, etc. So you would think it would suit the Red Bull that bit more, but it's I, I think it's going to be very very close. It's going to be fine margins, very fine margins. But I think I don't know as as Lando maybe put a bit of a, a line in the sand now to say. You know, because Max's driving style and, you know, similar to Senna's in a lot of ways was, well, I'm coming mm. through, it's up to you if we crash or not. Yeah, um, whether you like it or not. But I, <laughs> again, I, I think with Senna, there was a bit more, I'm coming through, you decide if we crash. And he'd put the car in a particular place that meant the driver had to seed the corner, which, which I think is okay. I mean... Turn three at Austria, Rosberg and and Hamilton. When you know, talking of very good lifelong childhood friends who have a falling out when things get a bit spicy. Mm-hmm. There was uh, there was Rosberg on the inside, and he left turning in as late as possible. Gave Lewis no room on the exit, but Lewis had a very simple choice: wait, slow down, wait, because mm. Rosberg's on the inside, so he decides when to turn. That's it, and that's is is that not just I mean that that to me at the time the the move was fine leave somebody no room on the way out but so they have to back out and and tuck behind you and wait you hang them out to dry around the outside you know Ricard Rydell the way he would overtake into chicanes he'd be on the outside on the way in so they're on the inside for the next one and and that was it he, you know you you leave a car's width and that's, that's it. Craft. it's it's okay get on with it that's racecraft. That's that's yeah. that's sort of in car strategy. That's not your team telling you what to do. That's you knowing what to do, and uh, it's very very difficult to to gainsay that. But if you can do that without intentionally crashing into people, the, I mean, the difference between Silverstone and Austria is Silverstone's a much bigger circuit. The speeds on the straights and and on the corners are much higher. So. An incident, the sort of incident that occurred at um, uh, Austria between the two of them, would have been a much more eventful incident. I think a much more high-speed 
accident rather than incident at Silverstone. Let's hope it doesn't happen that way. Yeah, as I say, we want to see good, hard, clean, fair racing, but tough yeah. battles, that's what we want to see. Lando has put down a line in the sand, as you quite rightly say. That's his red line. I am not going to back down. Yeah, so I think that's I think that's actually, in a way, a good thing, because it's, no, you're not going to do that to me again, and that's it. And I think there's, you know, Lewis has, has had those sort of run-ins in the past with Max and made it clear that that's the way he goes but then it's you know you had Schumacher and Hakkinen and the Hakkinen was you know was was the master of fair play but good hard fast mm. racing but then uh there was the uh, the title thing was Belgium wasn't it and and after the race Mika was explaining to the Michael exactly what he'd done wrong exactly what he didn't like about what he'd done and exactly what would happen if he tried it again and it's uh, and Schumacher listened to him, and you could tell by the look on his face that actually he's maybe getting through. And and oh, is Michael going to admit he was wrong? I don't think he ever admitted publicly that he was wrong. But no, you could he tell by the look that. on his face he probably knew. And there was, I I just thought the, the afterwards the the Christian Horner, oh well, it, it, you know, trying to defend Max over it or say I I thought that was that was selling himself short. I mean it's. It's, you know, Christian is, is in a, a bit of a mess with things at the moment with uh, various bits allegedly still rumbling on and then rumours of a falling out with Jos Verstappen over the uh, the weekend as well and, and whatever else. But yeah. I, I just thought it was a bit insulting to say that, that what Lando did wasn't fair. I mean, that's, no, you, you do that's kind not. of need to, if, if your driver's done something wrong, then there's a diplomatic way of saying... I'll mm. need to look at the replays again and have a look at it afterwards and we'll we'll discuss it internally as a team and I'm sure if Max and Lando need to uh, to have a conversation they're good enough friends and have known each other long enough to to handle that like men and they'll have a chat with each other. That's it. Done. Draw a line under it. Move on to the next question. Not very difficult I think to fall out with Joss because he can be a a fairly outspoken character and um He's he's not been modifying his language recently in uh, talking about the team and particularly about Christian and about the departure of Adrian Newey, etc., etc. And sometimes uh, he just needs to keep his mouth shut. Here we go, the UK Voice Talk spicy F1 roundup. So things otherwise coming up in the not-so-distant future, of course, is the Festival of Speed, which is, what, the weekend of the 11th of July, I think? I think that is yes, the case. Is. I'll unfortunately be, or fortunately is the case, maybe, depending on which way you look at it, I'll be away at a wedding in Scotland that weekend, so I'll, uh, I won't be able to make it, I don't think, for the first time in a long time, which is a bit irritating. You'll just be far enough away not to hear it as well. <laughs> so I, I live not too far away from so James and I both live not too far away from Goodwood. So this time of year, we start seeing a lot of quite exotic vehicles on foreign plates arriving in the local area and staying nearby, which is always quite interesting and, and entertaining, I think. I like that. There's definitely the buzz as we get uh, as we get closer to Goodwood. So it always promises to be one of the worldwide, the perfect event, really, for any petrol head, really. It is something that's internationally known, internationally world-renowned. So there we go. That's, uh, that's coming up at the Festival of Speed soon. So, of course, if you can go and enjoy that, please do. As always, it's been fantastic talking to you guys, but we really must bring this to a close. So from me, Mike, goodbye. From me, Jim, it's goodbye and take care. And from me, Graham, it's goodbye. Look after yourself. And we'll see you next time. UK Motor Talk, a first take media production. Don't forget to check us out on the socials. We are at UK Motor Talk everywhere.